Hello, my name is Deborah Dwork, and I am the director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the second of a year-long virtual series on the subject of the marginalized and the erased. The historical record is marked by voids, elided events, disappeared people, erased accounts, marginalized communities. Our series on the marginalized and the erased tackles a number of those blank spots in history and in our own time. I thank our series partners NYU's Professor Emerita of Hebrew and Judaic Studies, Marion Kaplan, and Stockton University Professor Raz Segal for their scholarly engagement. I thank too Dr. Eli Koretny, Deputy Director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for his unfailing support, and the GC's terrific IT people, Brad Holshore and John Chinisi. Above all, I am grateful to our speakers and to everyone who has tuned in. Thank you for your interest in this subject. It is now my pleasure to introduce Marion Kaplan, chair of our panel. It is she who will have the honor of introducing our panelists. Very quickly, the daughter of a German Jewish refugee Marion transmuted her family's history into superb scholarship. She is a three-time winner of the National Jewish Book Award for three outstanding works, each one innovative and brimming with insights. And there is more, not least her most recent publication, Hitler's Jewish Refugees, Hope and Anxiety in Portugal, 1940 to 1945. But I will stop with an eye to the rich hour ahead. Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you, Deborah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our three speakers today, all of whom are very deeply engaged in this question and problem. Dr. Lisa Harris is Associate Chair of OBGYN at the University of Michigan Medical School. Her research sits at the intersection of clinical, obstetrical, and gynecological care and law, policy, and politics. She will focus on how the SCOTUS decision shapes medical practice. Eva Galperin at the forefront of cybersecurity research policy and practice is dedicated to providing privacy and security for vulnerable populations around the world. She serves as director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And Jennifer Granick is a lawyer and prize winning author as the surveillance and cybersecurity council with the speech privacy and technology project at the ACLU. Granick litigates, speaks, and writes about privacy, security, technology, and constitutional rights. I am going to ask uh, one question of each speaker who will answer for seven minutes, and then we're going to do a second round, and then hopefully we'll have also time. We've uh, planned time for Q&A. So Lisa Harris, what has it been like to provide abortion care since the Dobbs decision. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. You didn't hear me sigh before I came off mute, but that has, is what it has felt like. But I thought really probably the best way to answer this question is just to tell you a story about one day. And you can read so much through that one day. And so the day is August 1st. And August 1st was a Monday. Mondays are the day we're at University of Michigan, where you heard that I work, um, where we do preoperative visits for patients who we will see for abortion procedures later in the week. So I'm an OBGYN by training. Uh, I provide 
uh, full spectrum OBGYN care, and that includes abortion care. And at our hospital, we see people who really need to have their abortion in a hospital operating room setting. You're probably all aware that most abortion care in the US is provided in outpatient healthcare centers, but some people need a hospital operating room, usually because they have an underlying health condition that makes outpatient care unsafe or unwise. Sometimes they need hospital care because they've been sexually assaulted or have a trauma history and need or want to be asleep, want general anesthetic rather than the milder kinds of sedation that's available in outpatient facilities. Sometimes they have hospital care because there are already patients in um, our health system and were diagnosed with a serious pregnancy complication or a medical problem in their baby or fetus and have made the decision to end a pregnancy and want to stay in the healthcare facility that they know. But mostly we're seeing medically complicated patients and often we meet them on a Monday and then there are a lot of logistical arrangements needed to prepare for their care, their procedure later in the week. Is this all making sense so far? So um, it's Monday, August 1st. We had multiple patients in our waiting rooms and on their way to the hospital, many traveling many hours from out of state. When suddenly, like on, on my phone, a Detroit Free Press headline flashes across my phone saying that county prosecutors can now prosecute doctors who provide abortion care under Michigan's 1931 ban. And literally at that moment, we had to stop everything we were doing and get on Zoom and start talking to lawyers and figuring out what was going on. Um, but mostly we had to tell our patients that we didn't know if we could take care of them. For background, Michigan has a 1931 complete abortion ban on the books. It permits abortion only to quote unquote, preserve the life of a pregnant woman. Obviously 1931 law uses gendered language uh, and no other circumstances, um, not rape or incest or even some of the other um, exceptions that restrictive state, other restrictive states have. And when the Supreme Court decided Roe in 1973, that prevented states with bans from enforcing their bans. And so we had an inactive ban until June of 2022, which of course could become active again if Roe was overturned. Well, as you know, back in December, 2021, the Supreme Court heard the arguments in the Dobbs case. And you don't need to be a legal, I admire legal scholars, but you don't need to be a legal scholar to know based on the tone of those arguments that the court would be very, very happy to overturn Roe. And because that was becoming increasingly clear to folks back in April, Planned Parenthood of Michigan, where I also work, where I see patients in an outpatient setting sued to prevent enforcement of our ban. So in May, we actually had a preliminary injunction issued blocking enforcement of our ban should Roe ever be overturned. And then of course in June, it was overturned, but because of the injunction, it never came into effect and we continued providing care as usual. Actually, we continued providing a lot more care than usual because we were seeing patients from many other states, especially our neighbor to the South, Ohio, but also Kentucky, West Virginia, and Texas. I don't think a day has gone by since Roe was overturned that I haven't seen someone who flew or drove from Texas to get care in Michigan because that was, for whatever reason, the most practical for them. But on that day, on August 1st, so you know, our team is in clinic, patients are in the waiting room, others are still driving in. Um, a judge decided that the injunction that was issued in May didn't actually apply to county prosecutors and they could prosecute doctors or anyone who helped a patient get an abortion. And so we had to tell patients we couldn't see them. And as I already alluded to, many had driven hours to obtain care that was no longer available where they lived. Some had fetal problems diagnosed in very much wanted pregnancies. Some had serious health problems, including serious cardiac heart problems or other things like placenta accreta, where the placenta is literally growing through the wall of the uterus into the bladder. And it's a light can be a life-threatening condition. And for all these reasons had already been turned away from other outpatient care centers. And after time finally found their way to us and all were expecting care that we could not provide. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of tears that day tears um, of patients, frankly, tears of the healthcare team. Patients were panicking and wondering if and how they should try to get to Illinois or somewhere else. And these were not patients who could just make an appointment at an outpatient facility. We didn't know if we could even refer them to colleagues in hospitals, you know, what in medicine we call a warm handoff, because maybe that would be aiding and abetting. Maybe even that would be something illegal. Most didn't have financial resources to travel. They didn't have childcare. And in Michigan, almost 70% of people seeking abortion care are mothers already. 
Michigan's ban allowed abortion to preserve the life of a pregnant woman, but we didn't know what that meant. Like how sick did they have to be? What risk of death? 20% chance, 50% chance of dying, 100%? How imminent? Like tomorrow? Or what if it was later in pregnancy when they when their condition made them much sicker? So we didn't know if we could answer questions about self-managed abortion or if patients or us could face legal consequences for even talking about that. We also wondered, our labor and delivery is overflowing. We're in a COVID baby boom. We didn't know how we could handle more patients giving birth if that's what ended up happening. And we didn't know how ethically we could send people back to their counties in Michigan where they live to continue pregnancies when we know they live in what's called a maternity care desert, meaning there's no prenatal care providers and no labor and delivery within two hours. So this is all what's going through our heads on that day. To wind up by the end of that day, we had a restraining order and we could provide care and we called people back and we brought them in. Um, but the distress was enormous and it didn't go away because uncertainty remained. The restraining order was temporary. We had patients not trusting they could get care later and making decisions before they were ready to, making decisions to end pregnancies even before it was medically advisable when we could have known more information about their baby or their health. So we're still living with uncertainty. The election will um, give us a little more certainty one way or another, but that's, that's the picture I wanted to paint of distress and uncertainty. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying within the seven minutes because I know that this is a longer question and a longer answer. Um, all right, I want to go on then and um, ask the next set of questions or the next question. And that is to Eva Galperin, how can we protect our personal health data and that of abortion providers uh, will they need to reconsider their tools and practices for processing data? Well, uh, that's actually a really complicated question um, because uh, you you would think that the that the crux of this question is really about uh, abortion care providers and the people who provide abortion support. Um, but this all starts with the um, with the person who is seeking abortion care. Uh, and it starts with the tools and devices that they use every day and the people who uh, who make those, uh, those tools and devices and are therefore the care caretakers of the data that is, uh, that is generated by them. Um, so we have to take a couple of steps back. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that the kind of advice that we give to uh, people who are seeking an abortion or people who may become uh, pregnant um, uh, right now is terrible. Uh, essentially, we tell everybody that they need to become a secret agent, uh, that they need to engage in all kinds of extremely elaborate practices in order to uh, cover their tracks, in order to keep people from, from knowing where they are going. Uh, I've seen recommendations to uh, you know, pay for your abortion using cryptocurrency uh, and, and all kinds of, of thoroughly ridiculous shit. Um, what I recommend for people who are seeking abortions uh, to begin with is to keep the advice extremely simple. Uh, these are people who are having a very bad day. Uh, who have much bigger things to worry about right now uh, than uh, becoming international super spies that are uh, untraceable by law enforcement. And uh, we need to look at the ways in which the people who are being prosecuted for their pregnancy outcomes um, are actually being prosecuted and what kind of evidence is currently being used against them. And our mitigations need to address uh, that evidence. Uh, and that is true both for people who are seeking, uh, who are seeking pregnancy, but also for the people who are doing um, abortion support. So the evidence that we have seen uh, that is being used against people who are being prosecuted for their pregnancy outcomes is uh, almost entirely uh, people are being um, turned in by, uh, by family members, by people that they trust, by nurses and by doctors. And so the first advice that I give, which is not technical advice, is essentially be careful who you trust. The second 
is uh, to if if you are going to communicate uh, about your uh, about your pregnancy, to do it using end-to-end uh, -end encrypted communications with um, uh, delete with uh, uh, secret messaging turned on, which will delete your messages after a certain amount of time. End-to-end uh, -end encryption. Make sure that the company which is providing your uh, your method of communication does not have the contents of your communications, uh, so that when the government shows up with a warrant for the contents of your communications, they say, "Sorry, all we have is this pile of uh, of crypto." Um, and having secret messages turned on so that they they delete after a certain period of time means that when the government seizes your phone. Uh, or seizes your computer and goes looking for the messages, that the messages are also no longer there and that they are no longer on uh, the devices belonging to the person that you're talking to. So this is especially important. Uh, we have also seen emails uh, being used by, uh, you know, in, in these prosecutions. So people need to be careful about their email. Email is not end-to-end -end encrypted uh, and definitely does not automatically delete. Uh, so it's uh, extremely unreliable. Uh, and also, uh, we think that people should be very careful about where, uh, about uh, whether or not they take their phone with them uh, to sensitive locations, because your phone is essentially a tracking device. It is constantly talking back to cell phone towers, telling it where you are, because that is how you get cell phone signal. Uh, so that's like the the very simple advice that we give uh, to people who are uh, who are seeking abortions, and it is also good advice for people who are providing uh, abortion support. Um, people who are doing abortion support right now already know that what they need to do is to get as uh, as little information about the people who are seeking abortions as possible. Uh, and and they are they are very aware of that. In that sense, they they do not need my help. Um, but, uh, what people who are providing abortion support uh, do need help with is uh, their own safety and well-being. Uh, one of the big problems that we have seen with people who are providing um, abortions and abortion support is that they get targeted for harassment. Uh, and by harassment, I mean the occasional murder. So uh, they, they also need to take their personal safety very seriously. And a lot of that involves sort of compartmentalizing um, your, uh, your real identity or your life uh, from the work that you do. And that is, uh, that is more complicated and it's a little bit more become a secret super spy, um, but at least it is for people who are not in the, in the middle of a, uh, of a very intense personal crisis with a, um, with a very hard time limit right now. Uh, so that's that's sort of the kind of advice and training that we provide. Uh, the the last people who need to to really mind what they are doing with user data right now are the companies, um, because uh, under the uh, third party doctrine, nearly all of the data that we produce uh, on a on a day to day basis about where we are and who we're talking to and where we're going and what are you know what what we're searching for and where we're looking for you know directions to, um, all of that doesn't belong to us. Uh, most of that belongs to the uh, to large tech companies and uh, the makers of devices. And when governments and law enforcement are looking for that information, they are not going to send a warrant or a subpoena uh, to the abortion seeker or to the person who is uh, providing abortion services. They are going to send uh, their warrant or their subpoena uh, to Google. They're going to send it to Apple. They're going to send it to the large tech companies uh, and sometimes to much smaller tech companies, which have uh, more uh, a more lenient attitude towards giving up user data to uh, to governments and law enforcement than say Apple does is kind of famously uptight about it. Uh, and so one of the things that I have been doing is I have been going around to these companies and telling them that essentially, if you do not want to become an accomplice uh, to you know, the the things that are happening to people who are uh, who are pregnant right now, uh, who may want to end their pregnancies, and to the people who are providing abortion support, uh, if if you do not want you know, blood on your hands, what you really need to do is you need to make sure that you don't have the data when the government comes looking for it. Uh, and a lot. Of Hmm? Thank you very much. I think we should go on, but that's a very <laughs> important place to stop with blood on your hands. 
Um, I would like to now ask a question to Jennifer Granick, and it's connected a little bit to what Eva, what you just said, which is so far, Texas, Oklahoma, and Idaho have passed citizen enforced abortion bans, meaning bounty hunters, people who spy on women they think may have had an abortion, not unlike the block wardens who spied on neighbors in Nazi Germany. Those people received kudos in Nazi Germany, but here in the US, they can collect up to $10,000 in these states. How is that possible technologically? I, I, you know, to Eva's point that, you know, what we're seeing is people who are being turned in by relatives or by doctors and nurses. Um, you know, one thing I want to say in this conversation is that these are scary times and these are scary conversations. And, you know, I don't want things that I say, um, and I'm sure everybody else feels the same, to have a chilling effect that's scared where people are too scared to think that they have choices, too scared to communicate with friends or family, too scared to go to the doctor. Um, and so, you know, Marion, you may be the expert here about how people find trust, you know, and find hope when they're um, incentivized to be frightened of the people closest to them. Um, and I think that that's exactly what the anti-abortion forces want, is for people to look around and think, um, I don't know who here is my friend or my enemy. Um, and to, to rely on that, you know, sort of fear and confusion, the uncertainty of the law, the uncertainty of how investigations happen, um, to really like have this, this chilling effect on people seeking the care that they need, or doing the political advocacy that they do, or helping patients. Um, you know, the problem, I think, is, as Eva said, when we move through the world, because of the technology that we use today, we're leaving a digital trail behind. Um, in the real world, we also can leave a trail, you know, with traditional policing, um, where somebody can be followed, somebody can be, um, you know, there can be a stakeout at a abortion clinic or a poll camera or a license plate reader trying to find out who visits that place. So sort of the real world interviews, just the real world law enforcement. Um, and then, you know, what we are seeing is the targeted investigations where there is a suspect and police go to a provider um, or to a um, company or like an email service or an instant message service and, you know, with legal process demand having that information back, um, you know, as Eva said, that information is of questionable, has questionable legal protection under our law. Um, it is, uh, you know, technology has vastly outstripped the law. The law moves much more slowly. Um, and so we haven't updated our legal protections as much or as fully as we need to. Um, this is a major area of litigation among civil liberties groups like the ACLU and EFF. Um, but one of the really serious problems is that even with what our law provides as the highest standard of legal protection, which is a warrant, these banned states, the restriction states, the law enforcement there can get a warrant because these abortion related activities are illegal or will be illegal under their law. So that is not enough of a protection. Um, you know, we really need to think about data minimization. Um, you know, collect only what you need, delete it when you know, anonymize it when you can, delete it as soon as you don't need it anymore. The easiest way to protect people is not to have the information. Um, and then the final thing, people are very concerned, um, and rightfully so, about a kind of bulk or mass surveillance where there is no expert, but there's this huge repository of data, location data or search histories, and law enforcement is able to kind of go through there and data mine in order to kind of pluck suspects out of the, you know, out of the public. Um, and we're not seeing that now. It's obviously a, a fear. These are real legal investigative techniques that police use, um, but we're really trying to you know, focus on the kind of real world and direct targeted investigation that's out there. For privacy from people, you know, your, your neighbor or, you know, a, an angry family member, 
um, you know, this information about us is out there. It's on our computers and phones. There are even um, businesses that sell our locate data brokers that sell our location data or other private information that they purchase from apps that are um, less than uh, honest and less and kind of shady um, and make money from collecting our information um, without us knowing and then selling it to these data brokers. Um, we one you know there are efforts by law enforcement um, or rather efforts um, by advocates out there to try to stop these types of practices. So on the um, on the legal side, one of the bills that uh, the ACLU and other groups support is the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act, which is a bipartisan bill that would um, prevent law enforcement from purchasing data that they would otherwise need a warrant for. And a warrant is important because it means that an independent judge has assessed that there is in fact a legal need for this information as opposed to just law enforcement or police deciding for themselves. Um, that we support bills that would give notice to the fullest extent possible to the people who are affected, whether it be the healthcare providers or the people seeking care. When people have notice, they have the ability um, or at least an opportunity to defend themselves and to defend their uh, you know, to defend their rights in a court of law without having um, being surprised or having to depend upon a um, provider of some service, uh, including like a, a communications provider to raise those rights and to litigate that on our behalves. Um, you know, and then laws that would more fully protect health data. So California recently passed um, laws that would prohibit um, companies from releasing medical information um, if the investigation is uh, about an abortion related crime and prohibits businesses, um, California businesses doing business in California from disclosing information um, and these are like your Google's, Facebook's, Apple's of the world, um, even when they get a warrant, unless it comes with an attestation from law enforcement that the investigation does not involve uh, abortion, which would be legal in California. Um, other states are looking at similar things, whether it's amendments to their constitutions, laws like the ones passed in California, requirements that law enforcement seek a warrant and providers can't turn over health data without that. So there are a lot of efforts uh, out there. Um, we, need to, we need to vote. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to add that this is all techn technological and very, very important today. But I was also thinking about bounty hunters and block wardens and block wardens in Nazi Germany, where the trick was to lie. Everyone lied to each other. They lied to their families. They lied to their partners because it was the only way to maintain privacy if you needed an abortion. And to make a society turn into a bunch of liars has extraordinarily terrible ethical and moral uh, repercussions. So but that's another way of unfortunately looking at it. Can I ask Dr. Harris another question? Um, we know that outlawing abortion does not end the practice. Throughout history, it just ends safe abortions. Can you foresee the issues that unsafe abortions will raise? And what do you foresee will be the role of the mailing of medications? Um, in other words, what conversations are we not yet having that we may need to have? Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many conversations. Okay. I want to try and answer something you didn't actually ask me, but what I think is one of the main conversations that we're not having, but I want to do it fast so I can respond to the question you just asked and respond to a couple of things that I heard Eva and Jennifer say, because every secrecy is a safety issue, you know, to put a clinical lens on secrecy, it's uh, it creates danger. So I wanna talk about that also. And I wanna talk about the importance of doctors' voices. So that is at odds with you know, the advice, Eva, to be silent and, and uh, you know, separate your life. So there's a lot of paradoxes and tensions in here. But the one thing that I did wanna say quickly before addressing that is, I think we're not, we tend to think of Roe appropriately as the decision that let people end their pregnancies. But what we're not talking about is that Roe and then Casey, which was another Supreme Court decision that followed, were actually 
the only two decisions that we have from the Supreme Court that actually define your rights when you continue a pregnancy. Meaning, yes, we can narrowly think of these as abortion decisions, but what they really are, are decisions about the constitutional rights that a person, a woman has when they're pregnant. And do, do your rights change when you go from being non-pregnant to pregnant? You know, Roe said in the first and second trimester, the state can't ban abortion. In the third trimester, it can, but not if the life or health of a pregnant woman is threatened. So Roe said, yes, you know what? The state can be interested in protecting fetal life, but not that interest is never greater than their interest in the life or health of a pregnant woman. And in Casey, liberty was added to that. Casey said, for example, that uh, you don't need a spouse or husband's consent to have an abortion because that would deprive a pregnant woman of liberty. So those two decisions said, yes, okay, the state can have interest in an unborn human in potential life, but that interest is never greater than their interest in the health and safety and liberty of a pregnant woman. Those decisions are gone now. Both of those were explicitly overturned when Dobbs was handed down. And in the current moment, there are literally no limits on how the state, meaning a government, can express its interest in potential life, in unborn life. We literally have women now, and I'm using gendered language intentionally here, um, fetal protection can be advanced in a way that deprives pregnant women of their liberty, health, and life. We have no protections anymore. So that is very worrisome to me, and I think we, I predict we will begin to see increases in legal surveillance and civil detention and forced interventions and criminal prosecution of pregnant women, certainly for illegal abortion, as we've been talking about already, but also for things that women do or don't do when they're pregnant. And there's a long history of doctors or nurses or bartenders or partners reporting pregnant women who continue their pregnancies for some behavior in pregnancy. So, uh, and, and that happens in a very racialized way. It is almost exclusively women of color, in particular black women who are arrested and prosecuted for so-called fetal harm. And, you know, we, can, we are seeing that, can expect that to happen with prosecutions for uh, illegal abortion as well. So that's a conversation we need to have. This is not just about abortion. This is about whether people retain constitutional rights when they become pregnant. And we don't actually. Um, to speak to the other couple points and, and just let me uh, know, Marion, if, if I'm running up against time, you know, one of the issues why abortion has is so problematic is that most people see it as a political issue and they don't see it as a health and healthcare and health systems issue. So we're in this abstract fight about politics and power and not adequately connecting the dots for people, meaning the public and judges and justice and, le and legislators and you know university leaders, that this is not just a political issue. This is a health and healthcare issue, and we need healthcare providers' voices to do that dot connecting. You know, when an advocate says abortion is healthcare, that that just sounds like punditry. Quite honestly, it doesn't it doesn't help connect the dots and explain why and how it's healthcare. We need healthcare providers' voices to do that. And so, so it's really hard for me to hear the advice that I need to compartmentalize my life and not have a voice because without that abortion remains this abstract political issue and not a material lived experience for, um, for countless people. So, and my own research, you know, there's a part of my research that focuses on abortion communications. And it's very, very clear to me that, you know, we now have evidence that says audiences have an unmet need for more nuanced conversations about abortion and the kinds of conversations that doctors and healthcare providers can offer. Because we see the complexities and ambiguities of abortion. I don't see abortion as a political issue. I see it as I stop a future human from being born when I do an abortion. And I offer a pregnant patient agency and control over her life and her family's life and ability to raise her children that she already has in the way that she needs to. That's It's both of those things at the same time. It's not one or the other. And it's clinical voices that I think can offer that um, more complex perspective. So I think we're in a real, real pickle, to put it mildly, if the people who have that more nuanced view of abortion are too scared to speak and too scared to have a voice. 
And I think we're facing a lot of danger ahead if pregnant patients are too scared to confide in people if they have complications of self-managed abortion and are afraid to go to the hospital because someone will report them uh, if they're having a miscarriage for that matter, but they're bleeding in pregnancy and are afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid someone will report them. There's the secret silence in addition to recreating and reinforcing stigma is a safety issue. It's a maternal mortality and morbidity issue. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like to ask Eva Galper and a question which was already raised very slightly, but I would love you to go into it. Will surveillance have a racial element or racist element in terms of the surveillance and the approach taken to women of color? Well, before I wanted, uh, before I answer this question, I'm going to, uh, I feel like I need to clarify uh, based on uh, sort of the, the difference between what I said and uh, what, uh, uh, and what Lisa heard when I was talking about the kind of, uh, of advice that I give to people who are providing abortions. Uh, when I recommend that uh, people who are uh, providing abortions or that abortion uh, support staff should compartmentalize. I, it is about putting the decision in their hands about how public they want to be. Um, I am not telling people to bring their risk to zero. I am telling people to make deliberate choices about the risks that they are willing to take in order to do their work. Um, I spent many years uh, before working on this issue, working with, uh, with journalists and activists in, uh, in authoritarian countries, and uh, I would never tell them just shut up. Uh, that, is, that is absolutely terrible advice. No, no one should shut up. Uh, what they should do is uh, take risks that they have decided to take, make choices on purpose, um, expose information uh, that is only the information which is necessary for you to do the work that you think is important uh, and uh, protect the information that uh, that you don't want out there. Um, all I want is for people to have uh, to have agency um, in in the face of of an extremely um, distressing environment. Uh, so the second half actually answering the question, yes, Absolutely, surveillance is going to be racist. Uh, and I can say this based on uh, the many years of experience that I have with uh, the ways in which surveillance was used against uh, the Im against immigrant communities, against Muslim communities, um, against Jewish communities. Uh, and uh, certainly, um, I, and I think Lisa already brought this up, um, the people that we have already seen prosecuted for their uh, pregnancy outcomes are almost universally women of color. Um, so I think there is absolutely no question that further enforcement is going to have a racist element. In fact, I think have a racist element is really downplaying uh, the fact that uh, it's almost universally going to be uh, women of color, and it is going to be poor women of color, and they are going to be the people facing the consequences first, and they are going to be facing them uh, largely alone. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go back then to Jennifer, and um, some of this is a little overlapping because people, you've already raised some of it, but still, I think uh, this would be a question that Jennifer, that you would be able to also be more uh, explicit on. We've learned that some women have deleted text messages, browser histories, due to worry about potentially incriminating themselves and maybe others. Um, they're using coded language on social media for the same reason, because we all leave a digital trail. Um, what kind of data are we leaving behind? And is there any way besides, I guess, drowning your cell phone to protect yourself? Yeah, you know, as we move through the world, especially with today's technology, we are living this digital trail. Um, and I think, Eva, you were the person who kind of said the quote that really 
summed up the difference, which is the thing I'm going to try to quote you accurately. Um, so if I do wrong, let me know. Um, but you said the difference between abortion being illegal now and the you know pre row time when abortion was illegal is that now we're living in this surveillance state where all of this um, data exists about us and that wasn't true in the past. You said it much more eloquently, but I think I got the point of it. Um, and, you know, so now that we have all this data, you know, my view is that technology really has taken our privacy away in all these different ways. Our cell phone is a tracking device. We, our conversations now, instead of like being something we talk about face to face, which disappears, our conversations are now memorialized, maybe, you know, forever. We share photos and things like that with our friends and family, um, you know, online instead of when they come over for the holidays and we show them the photo books. So there's all this difference. But I also believe that technology can give us our privacy back to, you know, uh, to an uh, important, meaningful extent. And, you know, all we have to do is demand it and um, insist that, you know, we are going to put our market power where in, in products where that happens and create a, you know, kind of communal response, which is we communicate over secure platforms now, ones which give us control over our data, ones which are end to end encrypted so that nobody but the communicate the communicants, the sender and the recipients can get access to that information. Um, you companies that either don't collect our information, um, such as you know, uh, search engines like DuckDuckGo um, or companies that give us a lot of power to delete our information. You know, and as Eva said earlier, we're talking about people who are in, uh, you know, one of the most traumatic um, situations in their lives. We can't really expect the consumer, the person to totally protect themselves. The service has to take protecting us, um, you know, really seriously. Uh, as well. And so I think that there is hope there that we can use technology to protect ourselves, um, as well as being wary about the fact that, you know, technology has taken our privacy away. Even though I'm a lawyer, um, I do believe uh, that technology and, uh, you know, is, is more powerful here than the law when it comes to protecting our privacy. Um, but that doesn't mean that the law has no role. The law is really important. Um, and advocating for laws that can help protect people who are seeking abortions, such as the ones I mentioned in California, um, are really uh, important. Um, and, you know, there are, uh, the, the fact is that some of the states are going to have laws that try to protect people, and then there are going to be states that are going to have these prohibitive laws. Um, and that means that we're in this very strange situation of cross-border enforcement. Um, it's not that common, you know, maybe with like marijuana and gambling, where you have some states where something's illegal and some states where something is, is legal, um, or in this case, maybe even protected by the state constitution as a fundamental right. So we're going to have these very complicated and very interesting questions about whether a banned state can prohibit somebody from crossing state lines to have a lawful abortion in a different state, or what can law enforcement in a banned state do to get information? Can they get information from a provider in California where abortion is legal, um, you know, in a and can you can they use legal process to compel those providers to turn over this information? And one thing this means from a legal perspective is that we need to ask the companies that we do business with, the providers that we do business with, to fight for us because we won't always know. There are often our gag orders or non-disclosure orders, and that means that the um, entities that hold our data are going to need to stand up, and they're going to need to take some legal risks also um, in terms of you know, challenging legal process that interferes with our ability to get health care. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now turn to some of the Q&A. And there's a very interesting question there for the three of you, and you can all decide who wants to respond. The question is about HIPAA. What's the role of HIPAA in all of this in terms of privacy and secrecy and state intervention? 
And we've heard a lot of talk about exceptions to abortion bans when the life of the mother is at risk. But what does that mean precisely? So HIPAA and risk, I guess, and I will turn it over to anybody who feels passionate to start speaking. I can address the what does a life preserving abortion mean? And then I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to others to answer HIPAA because I don't know the answer. I have the same question, but um, the question uh, answers itself, which is nobody knows what life preserving abortion means. Does it mean you know, that someone, there, there are certain things that I know. There are times your pager goes off and you sprint to the intensive care unit or to the operating room because you know that if someone's pregnancy is not ended immediately, they will die because they're hemorrhaging, you know, bleeding too much or because they have an infection through their body. And, and it is very clear that you're doing, providing life-saving care. So I'm glad even restrictive laws recognize that abortion can be life-saving. But short of that, and, and those are not the common cases. I would say those are maybe three times a year where you know you're you're doing that sprint to the operating room. Short of that, it, it no one knows the answer. And I think we will only know when doctors and medical teams begin to be sued and prosecuted. And someone argues that, well, that wasn't actually life-saving. They weren't really going to die. You know, so if it's a fifth, you know, we see people with uh, profound cardiac disease where we might cite a 30 to 50% chance of dying if they continue the pregnancy. I don't, is, is that enough of a chance of dying that that would qualify for life preserving abortion? Do the patient's values, you know, do her, do her or their values matter? You know, if, if someone's willingness to undergo a risk of death is different from person to person, does that matter at all as we make these decisions? Well, if a pregnancy um, has no chance of ultimately leading to a baby that will be born and live, does that factor in at all? What if someone's healthy at six weeks, but uh, they have a significant risk of dying later or not getting cancer treatment or something? You know, we don't, the bottom line is I don't know the answer, and that is one of the the big problems. And I think we won't know until people begin to be prosecuted. Thank you. Would anybody else like to pick up on HIPAA or on just the legal complications of privacy, medical privacy when it comes to government interference? Yeah, I can talk about HIPAA. And um, for the first thing, though, I want to say to Lisa's point about the real legal uncertainty and whether people are going to be prosecuted or sued is that um, the ACLU has partnered with a number of other organizations who are in, in the field of reproductive justice. Um, and there's a network uh, developing to provide civil and criminal representation for people who access um, or provide or facilitate. Um, access to abortion. And this is, you can call the ACLU if you have problems and it's part of a referral network along with the Center for Reproductive Rights and the National Women's Law Center and a number of other organizations. Um, I also just wanna give a really small shout out to our reproductive justice or reproductive freedom team inside of the ACLU. Um, this is a crisis of, you know, sort of unprecedented importance in our lifetime. Um, but they have already been litigating in states all over the country because of COVID. So when the quarantines and shutdowns um, took place because of COVID, only essential businesses were allowed to operate. And in the anti-abortion ban states, they were classifying abortion services as non-essential and uh, issuing orders that those clinics, those providers had to shut down. Um, so we've, you know, this is like, a, has been a rolling fight um, that has come to this, you know, come to this, this head. Um, unfortunately, HIPAA um, doesn't really provide protection from law enforcement requests. It defines covered entities and then has a bunch of rules about what covered entities can do with our private health information. But um, law enforcement demands are an exception to the HIPAA protections. The thing I would say about that is that HIPAA does not require providers to comply with whatever law enforcement um, court orders or subpoenas or warrants they get. It is permissive and providers can still um, challenge subpoenas and warrants for health information that um, are inappropriate or that interfere with their patients' rights. And this goes to what I was saying before, which is providers need to stand up for us. 
not just the big internet companies, the phone companies that are left out of this a lot and are not, you know, have not have been very cozy with the government um, over the years and healthcare providers too. HIPAA doesn't help you, but HIPAA doesn't interfere either. Thank Can you. I just add, Jennifer, to make sure this comes out loud and clear? Currently, my understanding is there are no states that have mandated reporting requirements for suspected self-managed or illegal abortion, including for minors. Does that remain your understanding? I am not the person to ask that. We have the, the reproductive freedom people at the ACLU are the ones that hold this information along with like our women's rights project and racial justice project and um, LGBTQ rights project. I am a small part <laughs> of the ACLU um, effort. I just am the privacy and surveillance person. So I don't wanna make a representation about what the law is or whether there's, we know that there are, you know, bills that are, being considered. Right. So something I say now could even be out of date like a week from now. So this is a question for my colleagues, um, definitely. Eva, do you wanna add something? Oh no, I, I am neither a doctor nor a lawyer. So okay. I'm going to leave this to doctors <laughs> and lawyers. All right, then I think I have one last um, wrap up question uh, because our time is running out. It's two questions really. Are women's organizations and medical institutions gearing up to help women travel to neighboring states for legal abortions there? That would be part of it. And what kind of political advocacy should we support? Um, I'm adding this simply because I want to end with some kind of hope that we can move something in the direction of women's rights. So either anybody can jump in. I can take this one. Uh, so there are travel funds all over the country uh, and all of them need your money. Every single last one of them needs your money. Uh, this is in fact the, uh, the best source of funds for people who are taking these trips. Um, one of the things that I saw on social media a lot after, um, after Roe was overturned were a lot of social media posts uh, essentially recreating the whole notion of auntie networks. Like if, if you would like to come to my house, maybe do some camping, uh, these are actually not very helpful at all. Uh, to begin with, uh, these networks already exist. Uh, they are mostly being run at the grassroots level. They are largely being run um, by, uh, by people of color and uh, they depend entirely on trust. Um, also, when when you post a sort of anti network, let's go camping post, you're not fooling anybody. Uh, if you can manage to get your coded message through to somebody who may be seeking an abortion, uh, you have not managed to fool law enforcement if they're going to come along and try to prosecute this person for their pregnancy outcome. Uh, so you are not helping, you are probably hurting, give your money to travel funds. And I'll just add to that, that most, certainly it's true in the settings I work, uh, but most abortion care centers I'm aware of, in addition, have also hired patient navigators to help them manage everything from how to get to an airport, how to get on a flight for the first time in your life, which is something that many people are facing. Um, so in addition to the um, local and national funds, uh, abortion funds, I think probably any local care center, uh, whether it's uh, for-profit or not-for-profit, is probably doing things that could use your support to help patients navigate care. Anybody else um, want to jump in? Yeah, on the, on the legal, on what we can do, um, you know, I mentioned voting earlier, um, but there are this huge network of um, abortion rights organizations that are in like full out, you know, crisis modes, like the sprint to the operating room, um, but in the political and legal sense. And, you know, um, sign up for uh, alerts from one of these organizations, whether it's mine or another one. Um, we monitor bills that are going through um, the Congress, 
We monitor bills that are going through um, states. The ACLU has affiliates in every state, so we have people who know what's happening in every state house and every, um, you know, every legislative ses session. We and so when something is happening and it's time to call your representative um, and let them know what you support, um, these these. Um, mailing lists or sort of activist lists are there for you to know when you can target your um when you can target your your advocacy or your voice to try to um basically let our representatives know that this is a legal issue that is important to us and that we are going to judge them on and we're going to vote about so i mentioned a few of these bills in congress before but there's a number of them working their way through you know from your from your state uh, representative all the way up to your, you know, who represents you in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Do you think it makes any sense to pressure the Biden administration? Yes, absolutely. And we've had a number of asks from the Biden administration for, um, you know, more support for, uh, for people. I mean, one example is to uh, have the Department of Justice and um, you know law and federal law enforcement agencies to refuse to provide investigative help to um, state law enforcement that are trying to punish people for obtaining abortion care or seeking abortion care. You know we have this like cozy relationship between federal law enforcement. It provides forensic services for cell phones, um, all kinds of other training and support. And you know so uh, the federal law enforcement can just say to states, we're not helping you with this you know, for example, um, there are a number of ways that, you know, federal government provides funding for law enforcement. There's, there's a number of ways in which the federal government enables state law enforcement, and we can ask the Biden administration, you know, not to do that anymore. And I guess the last question, because we're really close to the end, um, is whether Eva mentioned something about going to these companies and about having blood on their hands. But I'm wondering, is there any way that we can also engage some of these companies to work in terms of women's rights? And I'm talking about the big ones. You there know, is, companies. absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the things that, that, uh, that people could do is they can demand that any company that uh, provides uh, messaging services um, implement end-to-end -end encryption uh, every time by default uh, with an option for self-deleting messages. Um, there, there was a recent case in Nebraska in which a woman was prosecuted for her pregnancy outcome and some of the evidence that was used against her were her Facebook Messenger messages. And Facebook has been promising to end-to-end to end encrypt their messages uh, in Facebook Messenger for years. They were like, ah, we'll get right on it. We're totally going to get right on it. It's absolutely the next thing that we're doing. And they didn't do it. And this woman has paid the price. Um, additionally, Facebook owns the, the largest uh, provider of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services in the world. Uh, WhatsApp has 2 billion users, all of whom are using end-to-end -end encrypted messaging every day without even knowing it. Um, Facebook has now promised that they will roll out end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messaging for a Facebook Messenger next year. I'm not holding my breath, and I'm definitely not giving companies credit for things that they haven't done yet uh, for making me a bunch of vaporware promises. So uh, it's really important to keep the pressure on the companies, and uh, not just Facebook, uh, but uh, everybody. If you, uh, if you are using some sort of uh, messaging service to communicate with someone else, you should check to see whether or not it is end-to-end -end encrypted. And if it is not, you should be asking that company, why not? What are you doing to protect people? Thank you very I think much. There's also a data retention issue too. You know, if data is collected for some service, um, delete it as soon as possible, or make the service not as good and don't keep data about search uh, search queries that have to do with um, obtaining abortion care or um, or. Uh, pills for self-managed abortion. Don't keep information, location information about people's visits to medical facilities or clinics. You know, we're really um, demanding that uh, data not be kept and that when there is legal process that companies fight, both to give us notice and to um, not comply if the request interferes with, um, with our rights. 
I have to thank all three of you for helping to guide us through these very complicated and scary times. And I think our listeners are also very appreciative. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And keep up the good work. Keep up the fight. Thank you. Thank you. I add my voice to Marion's and I thank you, Lisa, Eva, and Jennifer for the work each of you does and for your participation in this event. Indeed, many thanks to everyone, speakers and listeners for joining today. Unfortunately, the conversation prompts all of us to think anew and to worry more about many significant matters. Thank you. <laughs>